So this is the module on torts and immunity in the Law for Teachers class. I'm Justin Bathin. So first big question, what is a tort? So, you know, is this coming to mind? Well, absolutely, that is correct. That is a tort. It looks lovely, very tasty. Mm, I could really go for one right now, but it is not the tort that is relevant for our class. For us, what I want you to think about when you're thinking torts is an injury, okay? Because injuries and torts just go together, like chocolate and strawberries from the previous image. Mm, I just can't get it out of my head. <laughs> so a tort is a civil wrong, which an individual breaks their mandatory obligations as citizens to other individuals within that jurisdiction resulting in harm, okay? So a tort is the breaking of mandatory obligations that we have to one another all as citizens, none of which really get written down. It's just the things that we all know and the juries decide resulting in harm. Okay, that's different though than a contract. Contracts are voluntary agreements that people enter into when those things get broken, that's a breach of contract. But these torts things, these are mandatory obligations that we all have to one another, not to walk down the street and just kick someone randomly. That's a mandatory obligation that we have on all of us, right? We all would say that that's unreasonable to do. Well, every time that you use that word reasonable, that's a huge clue, huge clue that you're talking about a tortious obligation. Okay? So what does this mean for us in schools before we move on? Kids get hurt all the time in schools, all the time. And it's going to happen to you in your classroom. Now that might have been a result of your negligence for perhaps, or you might have been the one that knocked into them and pushed them over and broke their arm or something. That might happen, especially you art teachers kids are up and about, they have lots of utensils in their hands, sometimes they're sharp objects, kids are going to get hurt, it's going to happen, sometimes you might be the cause of it, all of this might then cause a tort, okay? So let's dive in and ask ourselves, when does and when doesn't a tort occur? Boom. So what is negligence? This is the first big area of torts. Negligence is failing to act when a reasonable person would have acted, okay? So this is the legal duty that we have to everyone else to protect each other from risk. There are four elements to negligence, an injury, a duty, a breach of duty, causation. You put those four things together and you have negligence. Let's dive in to each one of those. So an injury, this is, has to be like a literal injury, okay? It can include economic interests, but like something has to have been harmed and frequently that is actually a physical body itself. The duty that we have to one another gets pretty uh, in detail. We won't go to it in great detail in this course, but you know these duties that we have to each other, right? To protect kids with reasonable care, to provide proper instruction, adequate supervision for kids, maintaining the facilities and the equipment and the grounds and to warn kids when there is something wrong going on. And collectively, we put a duty on top of all teachers called in loco parentis, which is just Latin for exactly what you think it would mean, in lieu of parents. So we hold teachers to all the duties that we would hold parents to while the kids are underneath your care. All right, those are the vast quantity of duties that you are held to in your role as a teacher. Sometimes you will break those duties, okay? Sometimes it might be willful and wanton. We'll talk about that when we talk about intentional torts. But most of the times it's accidental, but still a breach. And then, of course, we need to ask the question of causation. Did your breach of your duty cause the injury to the kid? Right? These are the questions that we ask. The four big questions. I would say they're probably important to remember for an exam. Just throwing that out there. So, the four elements of negligence, but there are some defenses, thankfully, for you. Okay, so the defenses to negligence include contributory and comparative, where everyone gets assigned a percentage of the fault, assumption of the risk. Sometimes we say that people assume risks. However, I will say with um, 
minors, this is not as useful because they're kids. We don't expect them to know the risks associated with any activity necessarily. But, you know, sometimes high school kids will say they assume the risk. Playing football sometimes, schools get out of trouble for assumption of the risk. I can't say that permission to slips work ex exceptionally well, but it's worth a try. Uh, frequently, though, that we still owe a duty even if there are permission slips in place. The big one for you, though, is governmental immunity. All right, this is key for you. This is a huge concept. I could teach a whole class on just this concept. But the concept is that you as a state actor, remember, you're a public employee if you work at a public school. This does not apply to you private school folks. You private school folks are subject to negligence. But you public school folks get huge protection with governmental immunity where public entities can be um, accepted out of some negligence lawsuits when specific elements apply. This is a super detailed slide. You can see I'm citing a Kentucky revised statute there. I don't want to go into great detail on this. You don't need to remember great detail on this, but what you do need to remember are basically scope of employment. So you're a governmental entity. When you're acting in your individual capacity in a discretionary manner, we're going to protect that. When you're just doing your job, though, and you are doing that job in your scope of employment, we're going to protect that. Where we're not going to protect is that lighter shade where you're doing something outside the scope of your employment. We're not going to protect that, meaning you will subject both the school and yourself personally to a potential negligence claim. That could be bad for you. You could potentially lose your house if the case is bad enough. And so I want you to be ultra cautious in this area. Um, and what does this mean? Well, here's a practical example. So you're teaching your class. Everything's going well, teaching art, you're teaching math, whatever you're teaching. You're in your room. Your cell phone rings. You step out of your class into the hallway to take that call right? Is that your, inside the scope of your employment? Is taking a personal cell phone call inside the scope of your employment? No, it is not. And that is where the big problem is. Because in taking that cell phone call, you have now put both the school and yourself personally at risk for everything that happens inside that classroom while you're outside of it. That's why we're so adamant about doing your job and staying in supervision of the kids because the minute that you step out of that role as a teacher and you step into some personal role during your school day, boom, you're not functioning as a teacher anymore and now you're outside of the scope of employment and subject to all of this negligence. That's why it's so important to continue to do your job, take that cell phone call later, um, and you'll have yourself protected as a teacher against all the injuries that might occur in that classroom. So malpractice, I'm not gonna harp on this big, just know that you can do a lousy job as a teacher and that's okay. You could do a lousy job as a doctor and you're gonna get sued mercilessly and go out of business. But as teachers in this country, we've just generally decided that we're not gonna hold them liable for doing a bad job. Now that's probably a good thing for all of you, but I'm not sure it's a great policy. Either which way, you can't get sued for doing a bad job, but just let's please do a good job. All right, just quickly through intentional torts then. Intentional torts are what they mean. It's when, you know, somebody actually intends to harm someone else. When you intend to harm someone else, that's clearly not within the scope of your duties as a teacher. Therefore, all of this is unprotected. And anytime you intentionally try to harm kids, you are absolutely subject to civil tort claims and you could be found liable and lose your house or whatever bad consequences will ensue. You like my little graphic there? I feel like that's fun. I don't love sm using smart art, but you know, that was a little fun little clip art piece. So um, some elements, assault is when you place another in fear of bodily harm. No actual physical contact needs to take place. You just scare the heck out of someone and it actually gives them harm. That would be an assault. Battery is when you actually carry out the assault, when you actually pull the trigger or stab the knife or something like that. That's a battery. False imprisonment is a element that comes up in schools. You know, this is where you draw a circle on the board and you tell the kid to stick their nose in it and you leave them for two hours. 
you know, that's false imprisonment. You know, you as a public entity are sort of falsely imprisoning some kid. If you duct tape kids to the chair or something, God, don't do that. That's one of my absolute pet peeves. Do not use duct tape as a disciplinary tool, teachers. It seems reasonable, but it happens. So any of that is false imprisonment. Again, intentional harm, and you could be found liable. And intentional infliction of emotional distress, okay? Flagrant, extreme, outrageous conduct on your behalf that actually causes harm to kids or other adults in the building. That is potentially also tortious conduct. So, you know, those things are all pretty clearly wrong. Don't do them. But if you wind up having done them in your career, you can be subject to some pretty bad legal consequences. So that's torts. On the whole, your takeaway is that you do your job as a teacher, avoid doing anything harm, intentionally harmful to any kids, and generally you're going to be well protected inside of this space. But, you know, it's difficult to not take that personal phone call or to step outside for any various reasons. I know that that's hard, but do keep in mind there are legal consequences when you do those things. So that's torts. Thanks for listening.